Good morning, everybody. Um, Steve has sort of given a sort of bit of an overview about Public Health England, um, which many organisations in England moved into work in the broader public health field. I come from the part that was originally part of the Health Protection Agency, and now it's in the Health Protection Directorate, and actually sits in what's actually called the National Centre of Infectious Disease Surveillance Control, based in London. But what I'm going to do is talk a bit about um, what uh, we have in relation to information on relating to injecting drug use and infections. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about relates to things that we'll be looking at in some more detail and with some more recent data in this year's shooting up report, which is due out on the 8th of November. Um, one of the key data sources that underpins what I talk about is the Unlinked Anonymous Monitoring Survey. I'm not going to talk in great detail about this because many of you in this room know about this survey, have been involved in it, are involved in it, or if you're not, probably should be. Um, but basically, it's a national survey across England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Public Health England does do things that cover other parts of the UK in certain situations. Um, and it recruits people who inject drugs through a variety of different services, including needle and syringe exchange programs. It provides key data on HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, risk behaviours, uh, and a number of other issues related to public health uh, and harm related to injecting drug use. There are various slides through my presentation just to try and not overload you with graphs, which I'm quite renowned for doing. I'm not as bad as my colleague, Mike Hickman, who probably sticks back six of my slides onto one slide, but I thought put in a few nice little pretty pictures. Um, and just this is there to remind me to say that the people that get recruited into the anonymous monitoring survey are principally people who use psychoactive drugs. So there are heroin, or heroin and crack injectors, also small numbers of individuals using amphetamine and cocaine. So just bear that in mind as I go through the next few slides. We're dealing with part of our injecting population. OK, they're probably not using these versions, and I always find the idea, if you're so slightly <laughs> overweight and had toothache, you'd be described a mixture of amphetamines and cocaine, but... Um, OK, so, looking at uh, the from the UA, so what we see, and this has been going on for a long time, so we have a nice time series, is that the levels of hepatitis C infection and hepatitis B infection have declined markedly over time. In the case of hepatitis C, from over 60% in the early 1990s to around 45% now. Hepatitis B ever infections, it's been every edition, not current infection, has gone from around 45% down to around 16 or 17% now. So these are marked declines over time. And the principal driver of these is going to be services that prevent infection. Needle and syringe exchange programs, opiate substitution therapy, harm reduction type approaches, supported by good drug treatment. So whilst infection with hepatitis C and B are still remain relatively high, although the level of HIV has fluctuated over time, it is actually relatively low compared with many other countries, typically between one and one and a half percent. However, it does vary markedly across the country, being about four times higher in London than elsewhere. So we don't have a big problem with HIV amongst our injectors, but it's not compared to many other countries where you might find prevalences off the top of this graph. And that, again, is probably a reflection of the fact that we promptly reacted when HIV first appeared in the early 1980s, expansion of needle and syringe programs in the late 80s, and also expansion of OST, and also development of good treatment services. However, that data masks various things. Now, this slide is very confusing, and I was hoping to try and simplify it, but I won't go into the IT issues I've had over the last week, or all of PHG I've had over the last week. But what I wanted to point out is we've done some very fancy modelling work on the data from the survey. Well, I didn't. A colleague of mine did. And we looked back, trying to estimate when people became infected, trying to locate when the infections actually occurred. And what we find, and it's probably best shown on the bottom two graphs, which is outside of London, that where there are two spikes in periods of HIV transmission among injectors <coughs> in England and Wales. The first of these is back in the early 1980s. This is not surprising because that's when HIV first appeared. We didn't really know about it at that time. There were no interventions. The second one of these is around 2005, slightly earlier in London. So though we've maintained a low HIV prevalence, we've had two periods of when there's been increased transmission. 
We know why this one occurred, because we didn't know much about HIV then, we weren't doing anything. This one is a little bit more worrying. Luckily, it did not become a major outbreak, but we certainly seem to have had two periods of HIV transmission. We don't know what caused this. I can speculate, I'm sure you can. Something that happened first in London a little bit later, around 2000 or shortly afterwards, that might be impacted on risk. Anyone want to have a guess? Crack, yeah. Can't be certain of that, but it's probably, this reflects the fact that we had people switching from getting opiates to opiates and crack and increased risk behaviour, probably resulted in some increased HIV transmission. We can't be certain about that, there's no way of proving it, but that seems to be a likely explanation. So I think there's a little warning in there about changes in, in drug use. But luckily, this probably didn't transmute into anything because we still have, or still hasn't had then, extensive menus, P programmes, and expanding provision of drug treatment. So that basically stopped this taking off into a big outbreak like we've recently seen in Greece. Where this would have resulted in this graph going up like that. So, but it relates to the importance of vigilance. Okay, so remember that we're thinking here principally about our traditional psychoactive drug injectors. The level of HIV is probably stable with around 1 to 1.5% 1 infected. The majority of people who inject drugs who have HIV infection are aware that they have infection or are in treatment and receiving good treatment. The level ever exposed to hepatitis B is around 17% and is declining, mainly due to vaccination, with very large proportions of injectors now reporting uptake of the hepatitis B vaccine and many reporting course completion. The level of hepatitis C infection is stable around 45%. When you've got an infection at that level, it takes quite a lot to start to bring that down. Uh, however, although the vast majority have ever had a diagnostic test for hepatitis C, only around half of those with hepatitis C infection are estimated to be aware of their infection. There's lots of people out there with undiagnosed hepatitis C infection. And injecting side infections and injuries remain common, but there is evidence this is starting to decline. And this also all may reflect the fact the needle and syringe sharing has fallen from one in three to around one in six, one in seven. So this is mostly good news, but we are looking back at this point. HIV is stable, Hep B is declining, Hep C is stable, injective side infection just may be declining, sharing has declined. However, the patterns of injecting drug use do appear to be changing, as Steve alluded to. Firstly, there has been some indications that perhaps injecting is declining. First, if you look at new presentations of drug treatment in England, uh, the proportion who people that report, um, presenting who report currently injecting has declined slightly in recent years. And if you look at the estimated number of <coughs> opiate and crack cocaine users who are injecting, this has fallen by a third between 2004-05 and 2010-11. And whilst perhaps some caution in the absolute numbers here, this do suggest overall, I'm thinking with other data, a decline in the injection, or is the current injection of opiates and crack. However, there may be other things which may be, there are other types of injection out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Firstly, we know there's been an increase in the use of new psychoactive drugs, to some club drugs, and the number of people presenting with these at treatment has increased over time. Um, and, but interestingly, amongst that small group presenting at treatment, the portion who report injecting has also increased. And secondly, there are those who inject not psychoactive drugs, but drugs to change image and to enhance performance. And there is data, both anecdotal and some hard data from NSP programmes, that the number of this, this population group may have increased over time, although it is difficult to gauge because data is limited. Looking at these and syringe exchange presentations in this slide from uh, Centre for Public Health at Liverpool John Moores, we can see a marked increase in the number of people using these and syringe exchange whose primary drug is anabolic steroids, such that they are now the largest group using fixed site exchanges in parts of Cheshire and Merseyside. So briefly we want to touch on what these might mean for the future. <coughs> Firstly, thinking about in individuals who are injecting image and performance enhancing drugs. There are a great range of drugs that can be used and injected to change image and performance, but anabolic steroids are the most commonly used. 
uh, Health Protection Agency or Public Health Agencies now undertook a survey in 2010-11 of 395 men who injected image and performance hunting drugs across England and Wales, jointly <coughs> with our colleagues in Public Health Wales and Liverpool John Laws University. And they were using and injecting a great variety of different image and performance enhancing drugs. Overall, one in, almost one in ten had shared injecting equipment, and that includes needles, syringes, and vials. There was high levels of sexual activity. Condom use was poor. Three percent had sex with other men. There were high levels of psychoactive drug use, and one in twenty had injected a psychoactive drug. All this data has recently published in the BMJ Open, it's open access paper, anyone can access this, and I'm sure I'm happy with Jamie or anyone to circulate the link around. There's much more detail in the paper, but <coughs> clear markers of potential risk for infection transmission, <coughs> both injecting and also sexual transmission. So what did we find when we looked at the samples as part of this survey, the levels of infection? Again, this is all in the paper. What we found was that over 1 in 20 had antibodies to hepatitis C, which is much lower than we find amongst our psychoactive drug injectors. Almost 9% had ever been infected with hepatitis B, half the level we find in our psychoactive drug injectors. And 1.5% had antibodies to HIV, very similar to the psychoactive drug injecting population, which is worrying. And even if we take out of here the individuals who reported ever injecting a psychoactive drug or had sex with a man in the last 12 months. These figures do come down. This one drops to around 6%. This one does not change very much. This one, this one drops down a bit. This one doesn't change very much. This drops to about 1%. So that even if you take out other potential risks, there is still significant levels of infection in that population group. There's only been one previous study that looked at infection among this group, and that was back in the mid-1990s didn't look at hepatitis C, it found no HIV and a hep B prevalence of less than 3%, suggesting that there has been potentially some increased infection risk, of it, although it's very difficult to draw that conclusion as the studies were slightly different. Um, so there is some indication that there is infection among this group, possibly increased levels. What is driving this though is not clear because both of these are sexually transmitted. The fact that this is higher than that, does suggest that sexual activity may be playing an important role here because most acute hep B infections in the UK are as a result of sexual activity, not drug use. So it would suggest that we probably have a mixture of sexual and injecting transmission. But from a public health point of view, the fact that there is infection in this group, and these levels are around 10 times higher than in the general population, is a concern. Okay, so one of the potential issues for the future. The other one, of course, are the new drugs. Well, some of these actually aren't new, but these are drugs we don't normally associate with injecting. And these are sometimes referred to as new psychoactive drugs, which are new, or they are new for a while, and then they become old and they get replaced by another one, and the so-called club drugs. Mostly not injected, but many of them can be injected. And there has been particular concern, as most of you are aware, about the injection of MCAT. Um, or methadone. This is first reported in roughly around 2011, but is, <coughs> the moment appears to be quite localised, numbers may not be large, but data is limited. But what is worrying about the injection of these um, synthetic cathinones, these antithetamine type stimulants, is that they can be associated with lots of chaotic, risky behaviour. They may be occurring in populations that don't traditionally inject. Worryingly, one of the two big HIV outbreaks we have in Europe among people who inject drugs at the moment is being partially driven by a switch from opiate injecting to injecting synthetic cathinones, and that's in Romania. And there's indications that similar patterns are occurring in countries neighbouring to Romania, particularly <coughs> Hungary, although on a much lesser, a smaller scale. And there's also been some concern about increased uh, injecting of ketamine, although the data on this there is the data, mostly anecdotal. And although ketamine injecting has been around for a long time, Again, it's often associated with particularly chaotic and harmful behaviours. So I think that these potential changes are a concern. I can know of several countries where <coughs> MCAT injecting has occurred. In one case it was in Austria, where they had a big cluster of MCAT injectors, which often they stopped. That was good, they didn't get any adverse consequences. But if these things take off, 
and they can cause problems. Different patterns of injecting different groups, often much more free frequent and chaotic behaviour. So that they are a potential issue. And then something that Steve alluded to, uh, and that is also changing patterns of drug use and injection among MSM. Again, this seems to be some localised within a small group, subgroup of MSM and in certain areas, but again, it's a potential concern um, because that could, again, change patterns of infection and risk. Okay, so that's just a quick run through. The key messages I wanted to leave, and I think these sort of frame some other presentations later, is around we have potentially changing patterns of psychoactive drug use and injection. This is not a new issue we've encountered before with crack cocaine, but it could increase risk and it may affect different population groups. We also have, I think, a growing awareness that the, the nature of drug use, particularly the balance between people injecting psychoactive drugs and image performance enhancing drugs, is changing. Again, different population groups. But also, image performance enhancing drugs often see that they're doing something that's for health and fitness, it's not drug use. And that actually is a very different and quite important dynamic when it comes to public health interventions. I think the key thing to say is we need to be vigilant and need to be able to respond quickly to any changes because things can go wrong very quickly as they did in Romania and they have also done recently <coughs> for different reasons in Greece. Thank you.